Hello. Hello again. Welcome to another exciting episode of Carving the Divine TV. My name is Yujiro Seki. I'm a director, writer, and the producer of the documentary Carving the Divine. Carving the Divine is about the Buddhist sculptors of Japan, and I'm ready to present it for the first time in the world. And this tradition has a 1,400 year history. But before I do so, I, uh, I uh, let the world see my documentary. I thought it would be a really great idea to introduce basic concept of Buddhism and the history of the Buddhism so that when you guys finally watch my documentary, you guys can watch it at the maximum value. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our scholar, one of the most intelligent people that I met in my life, Michael Jordan van Hatzenwald. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for having me back, Yujiro. It's really exciting to finally be talking about things in Japan. Awesome, because uh, you know, your specialty is Japan and uh, you, know, you love Japanese Buddhist art and uh, any art in Japan. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So we talked about uh, uh, Prince Shotoku last time and uh, you know, he was a, a very uh, important figure to uh, make a constitution which favors Buddhism and uh, favors harmony because he thought uh, harmony is uh, very important in having a stable government. But today, I want you to tell us the brief history of uh, Japanese Buddhism. I know you're laughing because uh, you know, this is uh, such a loaded question, but we're gonna talk uh, very details in later episode uh, based on sect of Buddhism, also the period of time. So, but you know, before we uh, dive into it, I think we want to get the overall picture. So I'm sorry to put you through this, Michael, but please tell us uh, the brief history of Japanese Buddhism, please. All right, here we go. So you remember that two episodes ago when I talked about the introduction of Buddhism into Japan, it happened roughly around the 6th century CE by way of the Korean Pekche Kingdom. The, Kore the king of the Pekche Kingdom, he sent over an emissary with monks, with nuns, and with Buddhist objects over to Japan in the 6th century to try and urge the people of Japan, the government of Japan, to adopt Buddhism as its official religion. Now, it was... It was um, supported by one group, by one clan, known as the Soga clan, and it was not supported. It was counteracted by two clans, known as the Mononobe and Nakatomi clans. Now, eventually, the Soga clan won out, and what came to happen is that Buddhism was accepted as a state religion. It was through the efforts of emperors and regents like Shomu and Shotoku that Buddhism really took a, you know, good strong footing in Japan. But it was still a state religion, which means it favored the men in high places. It favored the aristocratic families. It favored those who were wealthy, and it did not really act on behalf of the poorer citizens, those who could not afford the practices. Now, there were six schools of Buddhism prior to the ninth century. You had Kegon, you had Hoso, you had Ritsu, you had Kusha, you had Jojitsu, and Sanron. Those were the six pre-ninth century sects of Buddhism in Japan, and they were state-centric. Then, in the early, yeah, in the early ninth century, you saw two men, Kukai and Saicho, come from China. Well, I wouldn't say they came from China. What happened is they went to China, they studied, and then they returned to Japan with new schools of thought, with new schools of Buddhism, the esoteric schools. Now, Kukai, he introduced Shingon Buddhism to Japan. And Saicho, he introduced Tendai, and he also played an indirect role in founding 
the sort of syncretic Buddhist school known as Shugendo, which is a mountain religion that combines Tendai Buddhism with Shinto and with a couple other mystical ideas that come out of China. Now, around the Kamakura period, which is, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say around the, maybe the 12th century about, you would see the development of the pure land, the true pure land, the Nichiren, the Soto Zen, and the Rinzai Zen schools of Buddhism. So that's happening during the Kamakura period, which is why they are also called the Kamakura schools of Buddhism. Later on, during the Edo period, which if you can remember is during the 17th century and onward, there was a decline in Buddhism. Then, during the Meiji period, there was something called the Haibutsu Kishaku, which is the Meiji destruction of all things that have to do with Buddhism. Why? Well, it's because Buddhism is a foreign religion. Remember that Buddhism came from India, through China, through Korea, and into Japan. It was not a native religion. It is not an indigenous religion to Japan. That's Shinto. So what the Meiji government wanted to do is it wanted to dispel all sorts of, it wanted to dispel all sorts of foreign thought, including Buddhism, and it wanted to reinstitute indigenous thought like Shinto. Now, luckily for us, the destruction did not cover the entire country. And a lot of the historical sites were spared destruction under this government, under this movement. And nowadays in Japan, you start to see a lot more zealous Buddhist worship happening once again. You see many people visiting Buddhist temples. You see many people visiting Buddhist um, sites, places where historical events would have happened. Prince Shotoku is once again revered on money, as you mentioned last episode, as a patriarch of Buddhism in Japan. And so Buddhism is once again a respected religion, even though there was that one period during the Meiji where it was really... It almost looked like it was going to be eradicated completely. Wow, Michael. That's, you know, thank you so much for telling us this overview. I know it wasn't easy, but you did it. Did it. I, <laughs> I got through it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we didn't know anything about the uh, uh, Kukai, Saicho, and the Shinran, Honens, and the Nichirens and uh, all the important figures in uh, Japanese Buddhism. And uh, those are very exciting people. And we're going to talk more about it. And uh, please stay tuned so that you guys learn more about Japanese Buddhism. So if you guys think it's, uh, it, this information is useful, make sure to subscribe my YouTube channels, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and like me on my Facebook, because that's how we do it in the 21st century. Yes, sir. Awesome. So we're going to talk more about Japanese Buddhism. All right. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. See you next time. Take care.